Well, good morning. It is good to see you all today. My name is CJ. I'm the lead minister here at Christ Hope. And before I start, I got a couple things I want to share with you guys. First, being that today is the start of uh, the Voice of the Martyrs' is big uh, prayer for the persecuted Christian. We want to call upon you guys to be praying for the Christians around the world who are actively being persecuted because of their faith. Uh, actively being persecuted because of having possession of a Bible, being persecuted because they are meeting in underground churches. You know, I, I can't help but realize just how incredibly blessed we are to be in the place that we are, that we can freely come to a place and publicly worship together. Not only that, but we have the freedom to invite people to come and worship with us. And around the world, that just simply is not the case. So I would encourage you to join the millions of Christians who are praying for those who are being persecuted. And at the end of the service, if you go by the hub, you'll see some stuff that uh, Voice of the Martyrs has supplied for us. They have a prayer guide. I believe it's a, a 2025 prayer calendar. Uh, there's also a postcard there to get on their mailing list if you want to receive more stuff from them, as well as some of their publications that they've sent out for us to be able to receive. Uh, throughout the month, we're going to be praying for them, and I just want to encourage you guys to be a part of that as well. Another exciting bit of news is that we uh, finished our job search for a next-gen minister. Woo! Yeah. Uh, some of you guys got to meet the candidate that we were uh, interviewing. His name is Tyler Johnson. His wife, Allie, and their young son, August, came and visited us a week ago. And they just were overwhelmed by how amazing the service is. Now, the reason we didn't tell you guys is because we wanted them to get an honest look of our church without all the bells and whistles. And ironically, it just happened to be on one of the biggest services that we had of the year with Family Sunday and concluding a big series. Uh, but it was an incredible experience. The whole process really has been one that we firmly believe God has orchestrated between uh, what was going on here within Christ Hope as well as what was going on with Tyler. And, and God just arranged everything, and it was an answered prayer that we didn't really have to go on this long journey. We were really expecting a, a lot of time in between, and God has just done an amazing thing. Next week, you guys are going to get to meet him officially, and then we're hoping for him to begin his very first official start date, December 8th. Well, this is the beginning of a new series. It's a relatively short one compared to the one we just came out of. It's just going to be through the month of November as we lead into the Christmas season. And this series was entirely inspired by a brief conversation that I had with Jerry Paul. Now, some of you recognize his name, but others of you who don't, Jerry was the founder of Christ Hope. Uh, in fact, he's planted a few churches. Another notable one was here in Fort Wayne. After he left that position, he went to Great Lakes Christian College. And then after being the president there, he came here and founded this church. Now, my conversation with him really led into uh, understanding that Jesus bears a whole lot of titles. But there are two really distinct and prominent ones that were not only given to Jesus, but that they were also claimed by Jesus. And that is that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Now that latter title, the Savior one, it seems to be all the rage. Everybody loves a Savior. Everybody loves a rescuer, and rightly so. When I think about Jesus and the salvation that I have secured in him, I look back at what my reality would be without Jesus. And the truth is, without Jesus, my own self-destructive tendencies would lead me down a, a winding path of death and despair. Without Jesus being my Savior, I would have no real measure for what is good versus what is bad. Without Jesus being my Savior, from the very first time I ever told a lie as little CJ, I would be eternally condemned, separated from Jesus. These are not attractive realities. They are not ones that anyone would desire for their own lives, especially when we long for an eternity with Jesus. But without Jesus being a Savior, 
Those realities are the same consequences each of us will face without Jesus. So it's a good thing that Jesus is indeed our risen Savior. But the title of Lord, oh, it is less appealing than Savior. And I think in, in logic, claiming Jesus as Lord comes really easy for us. I think the difficulty comes in its practice. Because the truth is, I think there are things that most Christians, when they look at Jesus, that they find unattractive when it comes to Jesus' kingdom policies. They're just difficult. Some of them can be very uh, troublesome to just digest. And that shouldn't surprise you, because the truth is, even Jesus recognized the difficulty of some of his teachings. He recognized that for some people, they will be able to grasp it and hold on to it, but for others, it will be a complete and utter mystery to them. And often, he would describe it in his teachings. He would say, the one who has ears, let him hear, essentially saying, those of you who can accept this, those of you who can understand it, I hope you accept it. Now, there are some all within scripture, well, all of them are within scripture, but there are some that when we come across as individuals, we have a hard time grasping even just the base part of it. We don't even have to look much farther than Matthew chapter 5. In the Sermon of the Mount, uh, starting with verses 21 and 22, Jesus says, you've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Well, Jesus, well, come on, I'm just angry. I don't mean the things I'm saying. I just, my frustration gets the best of me and, and my heart gets twisted and I say these, these aggressive things, but I don't really mean it. Well, there's a danger in that. A little further, in verse 27, Jesus says, You've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, come on, Jesus. I can't help it. It's just looking. What harm is there? I'm not actually doing anything. It's just all up in my mind. And even further, in, in verse 38, Jesus says, you've heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Now, come on, Jesus. What am I supposed to do? Uh, are you telling me I'm just supposed to let someone knock in my door and, and threaten my family and make off with my possessions? Is that really what you're telling me? These are difficult teachings, and, and we haven't even gotten out of the introduction of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, later in Jesus' ministry, uh, Luke chapter 14, he makes an even more difficult command. Uh, verse 26, he says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and mother your wife and your children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And then another notable one, John chapter 6, uh, in verse 55, Jesus says, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Verse 56 says, anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And then we get to verse 60, and it says, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? There seems to be this tension within Christianity for Christians who proclaim Jesus as their Savior yet struggle or even uh, entirely deny living Jesus' commands in our lives. Effectively, there are Christians within churches around the world who will proclaim Jesus as Savior, yet in the same time, they will deny Him as King. So this series, it may challenge you a bit. 
and in numerous ways, I expect, but the most challenging way that it will challenge you or that it will uh, make you come to terms with some difficult things is that my goal would be that you would recognize Jesus as the eternal king over all, proclaiming to be a Christ follower, and that you would willfully and knowledgeably submit to his reign and rule. And here's why. Throughout all of history, there has never been a king like Jesus. There just hasn't been. But we live in a world where there is a limitless number of things and people and parties and entities who are trying to pull you over to their side. And the more you are pulled, the more you will have this tension. And until you solidify who truly is king in your life, you will forever be pulled in all sorts of directions by these forces that are fighting to have themselves on the throne of your heart. And once you do solidify who's king, my hope is that you would choose once and for all the one true king, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is over all. And because of all of this preface this morning, I really want you to see one important thing. And that is, if you want Jesus to be your Savior, you must also make him your sovereign. This all starts with the nation of Israel demanding a king. They were fairly young in their history at this point. And the problem that they really encounter here is that they already had a king yet they chose to reject him. Now, God, from the, the birth, the, the, the conception of Israel, was the king. From the time God struck a covenant with Abram, God had committed to being their king. Essentially, the covenant was, I will be your God. I will be over all of your life. I will bless all of the things that you do. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. I will be your king. And all you have to do, Abram, is for you and your family to choose me as king. I will be your God. You will be my people. And from that, he promised Abram from one person that nations would be birthed from this lineage. And as time went on, God kept his promise. And as those uh, generations grew, God was forming and molding and shaping his chosen people from one man into an entire nation. And as those generations passed, we get to a man named Samuel. And Samuel finds himself in an interesting predicament because he recognizes God's sovereignty, but it seems that others, even his own family, don't. And the reason it puts him in such a difficult position is that he is the prophet. He is a spokesperson for God. But the people did not see him as merely a spokesperson. They saw him as king. They had already rejected God. And they have chosen Samuel, and because Samuel is the mouthpiece for God, they listen and do whatever Samuel says. And so eventually what happens is the people approach Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And in verse 5, this is how the scene unfolds. All the people gather together and they say, look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. And so Samuel does exactly what God told him. And the truth is there's three major problems that take place right in these few verses. First, we already recognized they already had a king. It's not like they were leaderless, and Samuel wasn't even that guy. It was God Almighty. The second problem of this is that the kings of the rest of the world that they're observing and saying, we want a king like that, is the worst thing for them. All of those kings were terrible, and they were not the kind of ruler that God would want over his hand-formed nation. And the third thing is that God didn't want them to be like those nations anyway. 
God intentionally chose them from that one man to be holy, to be set apart, to look distinct from the rest of the world. And so all of this problem of them desiring to have a king, you know, on the surface it doesn't seem that bad, but when you look at it deeper, it's not just a rejection of God, it's a rejection of his leadership, his, his vision, his, his mission for his chosen people. And God makes a point of telling Samuel, look, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me and everything that I've established. So do exactly what they're asking you to do. And that begins a long history of monarchy for Israel. And throughout their history, they have some good kings. Uh, This is all of them. David was one who was the king before the nation split, and then the other eight are after the nation splits to a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. But these are the only ones that the Bible says that they were good. And what makes them good, when we read the Bible, how we know that is because for each of these people, it said that they did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And so that solidified their position. Now, there is one interesting common thing that as you read about these kings, there is another notable thing. Some of those kings made it their effort to tear down all of the idols and destroy all of the places of worship throughout Israel, some of them very aggressively. Others did not make an effort whatsoever. They were all still identified as good kings, but it's interesting that as you read about that, it specifically says so-and-so did this work of destroying idols, or so-and-so knew that there were idols and didn't really fight against it. Now I want to show you a list of the bad kings. That is a startling comparison. And when you look at the leadership of Israel overall, you can see a big, painful difference between the number of good kings that God said those are the ones who did right in the eyes of the Lord versus the bad kings who did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Here's what I will say of these kings, though. What made these kings good or bad was universally determined by one thing, and that was God's judgment of all of their works. And what this means to us is we we have an easy way of believing this. God is the supreme judge over all the things that he created. If it's his hands that put it together, he gets to make the rules. And since he created everything, including his children, God bears the right to judge everything, including his children. And some of his children are judged in good light because when God's eyes saw what they had done, they had determined that what they had done was good in his eyes. And for some of God's children, God determined that what they had done was bad because when God looked at what they'd done, He had determined these are all evil, wicked, bad things. And for that, he made a point of saying they did not do what was right in the eyes of God. And these things need to stand out to us. Because good or bad, right and wrong, all of it is ultimately determined and decided by God's judgment and discretion. He alone holds the right to say what is right or wrong. He holds the right to say what is good or bad. He holds the right to say whether something is righteous or sinful. And the conflict that we find ourselves in is that we live in a world that seeks to rob God of that right and so fall into the trap that Israel had found themselves to be in in Judges 17, verse 6, which says, In those days Israel had no king, and they did what they believed was right in their own eyes, laying aside the sovereignty of God and adopting the sovereignty of the world. For Christians, we are still tempted to do that very thing even today. Each day, you and I face a choice. Will I choose for God to reign today or will I choose something or someone else to make all of the decisions? And in our world today, There is no shortage of lesser kings that are taking precedence within the hearts and minds of Christians. Plainly speaking, there are things or people or individuals or parties who will claim the positional authority of someone's heart. 
For the non-Christians, this should be no surprise. Because until they come to a relationship with Jesus, they can never recognize his supreme authority over all things. And that is because it just has not been revealed to them yet. But for Christians, on the other hand, we face a great danger in acknowledging God as the Lord by our lips, yet having someone or something else enthroned on our hearts. This is no different than saying, I accept Jesus as my Savior, but deny Him as my Sovereign. And for every Christian, we have to make this decision. If you want Jesus to be your Savior, you must also make Him your Sovereign. I want to take a look at some of the modern kings in our era today. Uh, The first one is the law and government. Uh, This is an obvious one, uh, especially being in the height of political climate that we're in today. We have a legal system that by design is meant to set expectations and influence behavior to establish a civilized nation. And so when a wrongdoer does wrong, they're punished. And when other people who obey the law, they have this freedom to live mostly quiet lives safe from prosecution. And that's not a bad thing. In fact, we often desire that. We want a legal system that is just. We want to be able to live quiet lives and not be bothered. And so if we know the rules, we can accomplish that. Uh, Paul gets to this in Romans 13. He says in verse 1, everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So, anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. What we see, though, is that there are divisions between we the people. And those divisions tend to create a lot of problems. Amongst ourselves, we exercise our right to be heard and our opinions to be validated. And while doing so, there are things in place to allow that. And that's a great thing. But in about three days, a portion of our nation is going to win And another portion of our nation will lose because that is just the nature of voting. Uh, At the end of the voting, there are winners and there are losers. And no matter what political party a person chooses and no matter what political party wins, there is going to be a portion of the nation who lost. And because of that, they will feel crushed. And they will feel that an evil person that they did not choose was put in authority to make evil decisions. And no matter what your personal preference is, you likely hold the convictions that your preferred candidate will do more good and less bad. But the truth is, there could be someone who's sitting right beside you thinking the complete opposite candidate will do the exact same thing. That their candidate, though it's different from yours, will do more good and less bad. And the reality is in this passage in Romans, Paul doesn't say, do your best to hold political sway. Instead, he instructs everyone to submit themselves to the governing authorities because God is in constant control. Now, does that mean to deny yourself that free access to vote? Well, absolutely not. I think you should vote, and I think you should hold to your convictions, because in our nation, I believe that as God moves in the hearts of believers, that they will go out and vote, and these things will end up being determined. But ultimately, what Paul is saying here is that even in times where there's a bad king, it's because God has established it. And there's a really big example of that in the Old Testament. The Babylonian exile happened because God let the Babylonian kings sweep in, annihilate Israel, spread them all out, and then take a portion to live right there in their own uh, homes and their places and force them to adopt all kinds of lifestyles until God's judgment finally released. Now, we Christians, we know this in our heart of hearts. And we trust that this is the case. We trust that we have a good God who is always in control. Yet we allow the political climate 
and, and all of these things to sway our preferences. And, and through that sway, through that movement, we actually allow the political climate and the culture that it produces to actually sit on the throne of our hearts rather than God. And you might wonder, well, how do we do that? Well, most of the time, it's the way you treat each other. And in churches, boy, I tell you, I, I hate election time because I see Christians who normally love each other turn very divisive and aggressive against one another. I, I hear other Christians who say, you know, if, if you choose this candidate, I don't even know if you could be a Christian. Well, how could you? And, and it gets so destructive across the board. And, and from a pastor's perspective, I see a church insult and invalidate and actively oppose for what? What difference will it make in eternity? What difference will it make when we're sitting around the throne of Jesus? It challenged me to ask the question, do you not truly believe that God's will is going to prevail in all things? And as a Christian who may not truly put their trust in God, those Christians will feel the pressure to try to control things that they really don't. And we can look past the hot topic of today. We can move beyond that because another king that rules our world is societal norms and cultural influences. Oh man, this is a big one too. Because insecure Christians will fold to the cunning words of influencers and they will cling to sound bites. They will form their entire ethos around TikTok and YouTube shorts and ramblings on Facebook. I did some research last week, and I discovered something alarming yet fascinating at the same time. When we compare the average time spent in God's Word versus just on social media as a societal outlet, what I discovered is the average person spends two and a half hours on social media a day, which includes Christians. So the average Christian spends two and a half hours on social media while the average Christian spending, uh, spends 30 minutes reading the Bible when they actually choose to read the Bible. The more alarming thing about that second part about Christians and reading the Bible is that only 11% of Christians actually devote themselves to reading daily. So if we do some math here, this means that a church of 150 people in one year's time, you can expect that church of 150 to spend a cumulative 136,875 hours on social media versus 3,012 hours and 30 minutes reading the Bible. If we looked at that church of 150 people in the best light, in the absolute best case scenario, if every person in church spent 30 minutes reading their Bible, without fail, their input from social media is still five times greater than their input from the Bible. There is no denying that societal norms and cultural influences are ruling and reigning even in the hearts of Christians today. And in all of these things, again, there is one common denominator. Because the list goes on of all the modern kings in our lives today. Some of them bigger, some of them are smaller. But the common denominator reveals who's really sitting on the throne. Who really is the Lord and King of your life? You know, for a lot of Christians, they may not utter these words, but the fact can be observed that who's really ruling and reigning in the throne of their hearts is King me. And I don't mean me, CJ. I mean that identifier that a lot of Christians, when they get to choose who's really in control of their lives, it's just themselves. And for non-Christians, this is second nature. It's second nature for them to put themselves on that throne because until they come to a relationship and in contact with Jesus, they feel that there is no one in the world or in history who will have greater care for themselves except for themselves. And so for them, it's first nature to make themselves king me. But for Christians, oh boy, we, we stake out the claim that Jesus is able to take greater care of us than we are able to do ourselves. And that his plans, his wisdom, it's all so much bigger and grander than ours. And even still, we deny him his throne 
and we choose to sit there instead. I want you to think about this for a moment. And because the truth is, not every Christian is that self-seeking. Uh, in fact, many Christians, I believe, have Jesus enthroned on their hearts and locked in and permanently in that place, and nothing and no one will ever be able to take Jesus off of their throne. But even still, there are things, there are priorities, there are people and, and just things that rule in our lives that will fight. And when it fights, for other Christians... Those lesser kings may temporarily or even eternally get themselves above God's priority in that person's life. And those things, those areas, those priorities, they were all put there not by anyone or anything except for King Me. The government gives you liberty to choose. You have a right, and you exercise that right, and, and the freedom that often comes with it means that, that for some Christians, rather than giving God the recognition of establishing world leaders, for those Christians, they put themselves in God's place, and they feel all this pressure as if the fate of the entire nation of the United States hinges on their decision, and that they will fight hard to get as many people on their side as possible. And the truth is, spiritually, that just isn't how it works. God is in control. And until you truly recognize that God is in control, you will find yourself often pointing fingers at people, calling them the problem, while you have an enemy who is laughing because Christians are fighting a war, a war against flesh and blood that Scripture says that's not the enemy. The enemy is spiritual. They're dark forces and, and principalities that are beyond the flesh and blood. And even in social media, you get to choose what social platform you sign up for. You agree to their terms and conditions. And with every swipe that you make, it contains a barrage of everything at all of the time. And in a single session, you'll come across a tasty recipe and then a tragic story, you'll come across a heated argument, or you'll find some AI-generated picture of a baby and a lamb, and when you squint just right, it looks like Jesus. <laughs> but the danger is, the more time you spend in that environment, the more susceptible you become to entertaining the arguments and adopting them to become your own. Or finding humorous posts that, that might be humorous to you, but incredibly insulting to someone else. It is a dangerous place full of subliminal influence over your life. And the more time you give it, the more it rules. And we could go on and on. But the point is this. When it comes to who is really ruling, there really are just two options. It is either King Jesus or it's King me. And I would hope and pray that you have the humility and the strength to admit that King me is not a better king than King Jesus. Lord knows, when I look at my life, it is evident that Jesus is far superior to anything I will ever amount to. And I have to actively submit myself beneath his rule and reign because if I don't, I am tempted to put myself in that seat, but praise God that there is one who can rise above. Because in comparison, King Me is not the lion and the lamb. King Me is not the Alpha and Omega. King Me is not the King of Kings. King Me is not the Prince of Peace. King Me is not our portion and our strength. King Me does not set the standard for good. And King Me is not in control. King Jesus is. And so long as King Jesus is, I know that Savior is a very attractive title. Everyone loves the hero who saves the day. But if you want Jesus to be your Savior, you must also make him your sovereign. And in response to Jesus' rule and reign, there are three things that I think as Christians we need to be doing better. The first thing is that when God gives us the best, we should not demand different. 
like Israel, they, they already had the best king over them. And yet they denied him and they rejected him. And because of this, they suffered and the world just continues to suffer. The more we subject ourselves to these lesser and inferior kings. Also, number two, second, as a citizen of heaven, you and I are supposed to live and we should actively live as if we only have one ruler. Your life is not a democracy. Your, uh, the, the code of conduct that you are meant to live by, it is not to be determined by popular opinion or a majority vote. You have one Lord and one King. And some boast in chariots and others boast in horses. But we boast in the name of the Lord, and the grass withers, and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And the third thing we need to do is to accept Jesus as salvation and his sovereignty. And I put a lot of emphasis on that word end because the truth is you, you can't separate the two. You just can't. If you're going to live like Jesus is your king, you're going to obey everything he says. And when he says, if you obey these things, you'll enter into salvation. But there's a lot of us who want Jesus to be our savior, yet truly do not desire Jesus to be our king. And if you tried to separate the two, you will find yourself to be no different than the Israelites who refused God and yet sought rescue from him when they found themselves in danger due to their poor decisions. And as this series unfolds, we are going to look closely at the words that Jesus uses to describe his sovereignty. He uses the word Christ. He uses that word Lord. And it's my hope and prayer that those who claim Jesus as the king of their lives, that they would genuinely and truly live like he's king. And for those who claim Jesus as their savior and yet deny him his sovereignty, it's my hope and prayer that your heart will be softened this morning and every week following that you would be able to both accept Jesus' righteousness as well as his royalty. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, your word tells us that your ways are above our ways and your thoughts are above our thoughts. But there is a temptation, God, that our pride will puff us up bigger than, than what we really are. God, I pray that you bring us to a place of humility. I pray that you bring us to a place of surrender. And I pray that in that surrender, we would submit to you in your entirety. That you are Savior, but you are also sovereign. And that those two things cannot be separated. God, I pray that this morning be a journey leading us through the sovereignty of Jesus and that in our lives, in practice, we would demonstrate that we are servants in your kingdom and you are the King Most High. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.